Hello everyone, my name is Jim DeWald and I'm the Dean at the Haskins School of Business. Thank you so much for joining us today for a conversation with Goldie Hyder. You know, this is just perfect. We're experimenting with technology. In fact, we thought we had a cold because this is probably the 100th event that we've done. But um, here we are, we've had some technical difficulties today, but we've got a great strong art audience and I'm so thrilled that we're going to have this conversation with Goldie Hyder. As we broadcast from Calgary, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Now, this includes the uh, Sisika, uh, the Pekani, the Kainai, the Tsuktina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. But Calgary is also the home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Please join us by acknowledging the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples in your location, which I recognize may be different. Now, this is the inaugural event of Haskins Global Business Futures Initiative, and that's why I'm very excited. The Global Business Futures Initiative is an emerging thought leadership center within our school. <clears throat> it's tasked with launching a regular Global Business Summit that will serve managers, directors, investors, and policymakers on the issues related to achieving corporate longevity and prosperity. You're saying, Jim, what does that mean? Well, let me put it in practical terms. We live in or are entering into the most disruptive times of all generations. Business disruption is not a theme. It's pervasive now. On top of all that, we have many, many social challenges, which I'm sure will come up in discussion today. Disruption targets incumbents, and incumbents, as in large enterprises that drive our economy, are the prime targets for disruption and prime drivers for economy. So we foresee a challenge coming forward, and the question is, are we, are they ready for the future? With that context, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Goldie Hyder, the President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. The Business Council of Canada is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization representing the chief executives and heads of 150 leading Canadian businesses, employing 1.7 million Canadians and composed of every major industry across Canada. In addition to his notable achievements in business and public policy, Mr. Hyder has a long track record of service on behalf of several charities and nonprofit organizations. He's a regular commentator in the Canadian media on business and politics and leadership. And today, Mr. Hyder will discuss what the Canadian business landscape looks like in a post COVID world. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Olieski Ozievsky. Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Haskins School of Business and the Academic Director for the Global Business Futures Initiatives. And I'm also pleased to welcome Tanya Verhulp, Director of our Executive Education Programs at the Haskins School of Business. Tanya will be co-hosting the program today. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Tanya, uh, to fill everybody in on how this is gonna go down. Great, thank you, Jim. So, and thank you all for joining us today. So the format for today's event will include a few questions that Olex and I have for Goldie, and the remainder of the session will be dedicated to any questions that you have for him. Uh, the Q&A feature is available if you'd like to ask a question, which you will find the icon at the bottom of your screen. And it's open to view by, for all audience members, so you can see what everybody's asking, uh, and you'll have the ability to upvote questions. So what that means is if you see a question you like or going to um, or going to ask it yourself, please click on the thumbs, the thumbs up below the question. This moves the popular questions to the top of the list and therefore they're most likely to be answered. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Olex and to Goldie to get started. Goldie, thank you very much for joining us and uh, I would like to start with a question about current situation in Canada. So now with the dust of COVID-19 essentially settled, we cannot live in state of crisis all the time, we are adjusting. So what is your assessment? What's going on with Canadian economy 
and Canadian business sector. Which industries bounced back? Which industries maybe didn't even notice pandemics? And which industries are still have long way to recover? Well, thank you so much uh, for the question. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm really uh, humbled to be your first uh, guest at this inaugural uh, opening of the Global Business Futures uh, Initiative, and also to come back to my alma mater, and that too, the Haskane School of Business. Dick was the board chair when I graduated from university in uh, 1991, so it's particularly um, important that I acknowledge that. that. Um, look, that's a deep question that could probably take up the whole session, so let me just see if I can summarize it in, in, a, few of these, uh, in, in a few of these remarks. The, sh the shorthand is it's uneven. Everything that we're talking about is very uneven in terms of the economy. So whether you're in one part of the country or another part of the country, whether you're in a big city or you're in a, a rural center, whether you are a large business or a small business, uh, this is the, 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 the reality of this, uh, of this virus is it doesn't necessarily discriminate. It's going to run through your country as it is running around the world. But there have been some that have been able to better manage it and others who have, have struggled with it. So it's a very uneven impact from a healthcare perspective, but also from an, from an economic uh, perspective. You know, I, I had a chance to travel for the first time in a long time for someone who puts on a lot of air miles. It was nice to get back on a plane, let me tell you, uh, to get to Calgary and to Vancouver and, and just to see how other parts of the country are, are responding. And it showed me that in cases of Calgary downtown or Vancouver downtown, it felt very different than the downtown I've seen in Ottawa or the downtown I've seen in Toronto. And that's an indication as to how I think the, the virus has behaved in certain areas and how governments have responded, particularly public, uh, uh, public health agencies. For some time now, I was concerned that this was going to be really a central Canadian problem, that it was just simply seen to be an Ontario, Quebec issue, uh, and that a lot of that would create some kind of tensions in the country in terms of how they're being forced to go along for the ride when really it's really happening in Ontario and Quebec. But as we've seen, that's not necessarily the case. This has certainly struck uh, other parts of the countries as well. And what we don't know is what point in this journey we are on. Uh, I, I, I don't, we, like I say to people, I don't know if it's the beginning or the end, uh, you know, or the middle. I'm describing it as the end of the beginning. I think there's still a long ways to go uh, in terms of, uh, of where we find ourselves. A couple of things jump out to me on your question. First and foremost is most Canadians should be grateful that our essential services have been functioning relatively smoothly, relatively seamlessly, including over the border. You know, there's been a lot of discussions about the U.S. border, but the fact is that, you know, trucking companies are bringing in goods. Uh, they're able to comply with the requirements from a health perspective, your grocery shelves, maybe not your toilet paper, but most things are stocked up pretty good uh, uh, in the country for you to be able to get the goods that you need. Your lights are being kept on, power is being delivered, uh, you know, gasoline's in your pumps. All of those things is an acknowledgement to a lot of businesses of all sizes that are being able to make sure that those essential goods and services are being met. The other area where I think we should take a, a moment to acknowledge uh, is the effort of Canadian manufacturers and Canadian businesses, again, of various sizes, to pivot, to respond to the PPE crunch that we faced across the country. Uh, you know, who knew that only Italy or China made a swab? Who knew that it was going to be so hard to get masks? You know, uh, these are not difficult things to make, and yet we, we were very quickly exposed to the reliance that we have on the global supply chain, and that triggered a, a conversation I'm sure we'll get into later about nearshoring and onshoring and, and protectionism and so forth. Um, but you know, Canadian businesses responded. Uh, Canada Goose, uh, famous for winter attire, was able to pivot and start making attire for our, doctor, our doctors and our nurses. Um, you know, CAE, Linamar, Magna, a variety of others started making ventilators. You know, 3M was able to you know, deal with a, a vert of potential crises with the uh, a protectionist attempts in the United States on masks. A lot of things have gotten done that have worked and worked um, worked well. So I want to make sure that people see that. And of course, a tremendous shout out to our healthcare professionals across the country who had to do yeoman service and uh, you know people who keep the buses going. There's so many things that continue to function uh, despite this crisis. But and this is the unfortunate part of this. This is the second half to this coin. Uh, a lot of people have experienced a lot of hardship, and in some cases. Um, you know, they're on life support. You look at our tourism industry, our transportation industry, airlines in particular, um, you know, hospitality, the re restaurants, the retail business. And for those reasons, uh, for COVID reasons, but also other reasons, the energy sector, which is near and dear to many of you and to me as well as a, as a, as a native Albertan. Um, you know, these are, these are businesses and, and, that employ hundreds of thousands of Canadians who are in need of, of support. 
Uh, it's not necessarily always about money. It could be about access to money, but it is, it is about a recognition that do we need these industries at the other end of this? How important is it that we have airlines? How important is it that we have hotels? How important is it that we have a tourism industry? So there's a lot of work for governments to do to make sure that while we've been helping individual Canadians get through this crisis, to also be there to respond to the, to the industry specific, sector specific needs uh, that, that are, are still very much um, exposed wounds, uh, if you will. And I think that is something that we're looking at in the economic, um, in the economic statement. The other thing I wanted to just note is um, many of our members that I represent had um, what I would call as an early warning system, right? We're very global, uh, many of our members, and we already saw what was taking place um, in Asia and, and in Europe and other places. And so we've been trying to work um, in partnership with governments uh, right across this country to share our experiences. And frankly, we've got to up our game. Uh, we've collectively got to up our game. We've got to stop comparing ourselves to the kids who are failing class down south and start thinking about the ones who are doing better and what can we do to continue to improve the services and the confidence that Canadians need in our healthcare system and, and, in, our, and in our economy. And my last point is, unfortunately, uh, it's a business school, so I got to talk a little bit about math. The math's not very good. Uh, the deficit is now, you know, roughly $400 billion, let me round up, um, probably come in less than that, I'm guessing, but $400 billion is a lot of money given where we were just a little, uh, uh, just a little while ago, uh, that, you know, the debt has crossed 1.3 trillion. Uh, that's just federal debt. If you add it up, the provincial debts to this, we're in really difficult position and the credit agencies are taking note of that. Our GDP's down, you know, 16% or so, probably end up down about 6 to 8% by the end of the year. And let's not forget 10% of Canadians are unemployed. So we have got a lot of work to do. Thank you for that, Goldie. Uh, I think that overview uh, sh shares the sentiment, I think, of what we're seeing so many businesses experiencing right now. Um, my first question is looking ahead a little bit. And what do you see the future of Canadian business looking like in a post-COVID world, however long that might be? Well, look, uh, I think Jim's comments or his opening was spot on. Uh, COVID has been a disruptor. Uh, it is just another form of disruption uh, for business, for leaders, uh, for institutions, and for, for, for governments. And so, like any other challenge, the question is, how do you respond? Uh, what I have observed from those that are doing well, and let me be clear, like the vast majority of, of the larger Canadian businesses, um, are, doing, are doing well. I mean, they've been able to adjust. They were able to pivot. They were able to make sure that work from home became a viable option and people were equipped to do it. Thank God for our, tech, our infrastructure around broadband and the investments that our telecommunications companies have been making. And there's more to do uh, to make sure that there is equality of opportunity for Canadians wherever they might live, urban, rural, you know, north or very remote areas. Because what you've seen is technology is, is the great enabler now. It is oxygen uh, for the economy. And so that's something that I think we, we have seen. Most businesses will tell you that what has happened is, is that the disruption has acted as an accelerator. It has uh, allowed Canadian businesses to move much more quickly than perhaps they were planning to be able to accelerate their, strat their digital strategy. For all intents and purposes, digitization is is really the, the, the memorable outcome um, from a positive perspective uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in. But along with that comes collateral damage. There are going to be a number of businesses that, that their best before date may have already been getting close to expiring that just had it expedited. And we shouldn't be out to necessarily you know, bring back businesses that don't have a viable future. Let's help them figure out how to transition to the new economy and to be able to do the things that we need to do. This is a, in many ways, I think a seminal moment in the life of our country. Uh, you know, for 150 years, we've had it pretty good. You know, the British had our back and then the Americans had our back. Today, I, I don't know who has our back. And so that means we've got to figure out ourselves, what do we want to be when we grow up? What, what is it that we have to offer the world? And I would suggest to you that, that a couple of things that won't change is um, we are a very strong natural resource economy. And we're gonna to have to have mature adult conversations about the reconciliation between the environment and the economy to leverage our natural resources strengths, which have been hijacked by the issue around solely the oil sands, when in fact our natural resources are virtually in every single province, from, you know, from fisheries to forestry, to agriculture, to mining, you know, to hydro, to, and yes, to, to oil and gas. 
Um, and so we've, we've got to have an adult conversation about, about this and, and see how we leverage our natural resources. And the second piece, only appropriate, I say this uh, to a university audience, is our human skills, our human resources. We are a smart people. We have a very strong, uh, diverse uh, population. Uh, it's it's going to shrink if we don't add to it. So I want to advocate for more immigration, more foreign students, more opportunities to connect ourselves back to the world and to, and to, and to grow uh, to grow our economy. We're an innovative group of people, right? I mean, I think we can we showed the resiliency that we have and the ability to pivot and innovate. Uh, we're going to need to do more of that. We're going to need to act with more hunger, a little more desperation, a little less. Um, complacency and, and, and overconfidence, because as I said, comparing ourselves to the kids failing class gets you mediocrity. What we want to do is be the very best that we can be. And I think we have to aspire to really leverage those national, national resource, the natural resources and our human resources, and really look at the new economy. Uh, you know, too often we build out Canadian companies, they scale to a small level and then they go. We can't afford to do that anymore. We need to commercialize our research. We need to grow Canadian champions and Canadian companies in all of these sectors uh, that I've mentioned. If we're going to be able to compete, it requires um, you know, a strategy. It requires a growth plan. And that's what we're calling on, on governments uh, to be able to do because there is no economic recovery here if we don't get some of these things right. We can't just you know, um, you know, tiptoe our way or, or you know, you know, just kind of meander through the field here. This is a moment where the, the strong will be separated from the weak coming out of this crisis. And I think we need to make sure that we have a plan to put us uh, on the trajectory of coming out even stronger than, uh, than how we went in. Thank you. Um, I would actually like to continue this discussion and push it a little bit further about technology disruption and Canada in the post-COVID world. So um, a lot of commentators talk uh, that we live right now in the world of fourth industrial revolution, where we have uh, the convergence of a set of general technologies like uh, machine learning, blockchain, social media, big data, uh, internet of things. All of these are essen essentially creating the new industrial paradigm that might totally change uh, the global trade order. Uh, how do you think, what can be a Canadian place in this new world order of the fourth industrial revolution? Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, part of what I said, uh, you know, applies here, so I won't repeat it, but we've had it easy. It's been pretty easy being Canada, you know, the, the, the blessing of geography, sharing a border with, you know, uh, the largest economy in the world. It, we, it, it's, it's allowed us to get comfortable. And, and I think that's an indictment of all of us. I'm not blaming any particular people here, but all of us need to look at ourselves and say, you know, in, as we look forward, is, is good enough going to get us to where we need to go? And the answer is probably not. And so uh, as a business person, as someone speaking to a business school, to me, it starts with a, a few basic things. Number one is leadership. We need leadership. We need people to, to help figure out uh, how they're going to get us to where we need to go. And we can't just rely on whatever the populist movement of the day is or whatever is trending on Twitter to, to help guide us as a guidepost as to what we want to be. When we grow up, we need leadership. And then when you get leadership, you get a strategy, you get a team, you get a plan. And all of those things to me seem to be lacking. And I, you won't find a more proud Canadian than I am witnessed by the flag over my shoulder here. But one of the things I say it allows me to do is, is be honest about you know, the, the good, the bad, and the not so good about Canada. And part of it is, is that we have, we have not had to act with any real urgency. When I think of countries like Germany, Japan, Korea, Ireland, you know, three of those four countries came literally from ashes. And what they did um, was figure out, what do we wanna be? What is our industrial strategy? And the way they went about doing it was to build a coalition or a parade, as I like to call it, of all the actors that need to be in this play, from our political leaders, our governors, to our business community, to our labor community, to our environmental groups, to our labor, to the indigenous groups and others, and said, what are we gonna do? Here's what we have. We've been blessed with this geography. We've been blessed with these human resources. What is our strategy? What is our plan? 
And when you put your mind to it, Germany is a great example. We're going to be an world, and we're going to be an economic superpower in advanced manufacturing. That was their plan, and they went out. They built an education system to support that. They built relationships with with uh, you know with the uh, stakeholders that needed to get along to figure out how to do this. Business and labor, a great example. They put in place the right regulatory policies that attracted capital, attracted investment, attracted people. Uh, if you have a plan, if you have a strategy, if you have the leadership, the sky's the limit for Canada. The sky's the limit. But what I have seen, and this is part of the tough love I was alluding to, is there are times where you have to wonder how dysfunctional our federalism is. Um, the, 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 the level of politics between our provincial governments and our federal governments and our municipal governments. I know the newspapers talk about how well it's all going. I know from having been at the table and seeing from the inside, it, you don't want to know how this, how this sausage is being made. And not pretty. And I, and I hope it's a moment that's going to be realized that we better get way smarter uh, than we have been. We need real, serious conversations with Canadians and leadership to get us to the next place. And let me just say one thing about Canadians. Despite everything I've said, one of the reasons I have a great sleep every night is I have an innate sense of confidence in the collective wisdom of the Canadian people. The, the Canadian people are a smart group of people. They can you know, filter the, the BS out. Can I say that? I just said it. We can filter the BS out. Uh, we can get to the point. We know what we're supposed to do and what we need. And we find the right, the right leader to, to get us to those places. And I think that the country and what business leaders want to do is be a part of that solution. We want to work in partnership with governments of all stripes, with labor movements and others. It says, you know, what kind of a Canada do we want to build for the next 150 years? What's the strategy to do that? And that will uncover both the, our, our, our structural impediments and our structural flaws, but it'll also create opportunity. There's a whole world out there and more of Canada would be a good thing uh, uh, for that world. The world needs champions for multilateralism. The world needs trade promotion. The world needs people who believe in immigration. All of these things I think are great opportunities for us and, and I, I hope we embrace that challenge. Thank you. I would also like to push a little bit further the discussion uh, about the role of Canada in the geopolitical world. So the world is changing from bipolar to multipolar or whatever is going on there. Uh, what will be Canadians' place? You already started discussing that we had Great Britain uh, supporting us, then we had United States supporting us. What will be the place of Canada in the world and how can companies adjust to it? Yeah, it's a great please, question. Yeah, uh, it's a sorry, great, yeah, yeah oh, probably, over, over to you, Goldie. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, there's, look, Canadian economy is built really on, on sort of three pillars, if you will, right? It's the pillars of, of trade, immigration, and investment. If you take off any one of those legs of the stool, the stool stumbles, right? So we cannot come out of this in any way where Canadians have become anti-immigration, anti-trade, or anti-investment. So we must do all that we can to promote the benefits and the necessities of those policies uh, to help get us to the next level. You know, the only way we can address the social issues that are being raised in today's society and all and rightfully so, you gotta have a strong economy. If we have a strong economy and a strong plan and strong leadership to build that out, and as the old saying goes, the best social program is a job, then we can deal with those who can't help themselves. We can do all of these things that, that society wants us to do only when we have both these things moving at the, uh, at the same time. And even though there's a push, uh, you're hearing it from around the world right now for nearshoring and onshoring and protectionism and you know, sort of uh, hoarding of, 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 of uh, supply chain things. Um, I'm gonna share something that my wife saw uh, on the internet about six months ago and it's very, I thought it was very profound. And the, and the statement was, uh, are we the virus, as in humanity, are we the virus and is COVID the vaccine? And I found that very profound because it takes a crisis and it turns it upside down on its head and it looks at it differently and it says, well, look at the consequence of this virus. Um, you know, some would say climate change is being uh, addressed. Some would say, you know, a strike or wars, those kinds of things have stopped. We're not seeing massive migrations take place. People aren't dropping bombs. There haven't been terrorism attacks. All kinds of things have been course corrected. We're spending time with our families. We're finding work-life balance. Uh, we're addressing big issues like childcare and so forth. So it's very interesting to see it um, uh, from that perspective. Because I think that what's going to happen here is whether you're talking about the health crisis, i.e., um, you know, the, how to manage the pandemic, or you're talking about the global recession we're in, 
isn't it interesting that the only solutions, the only viable solutions to both of those problems, healthcare and economy, or a pandemic and you know the, uh, the economic crisis, global recession, has to be a collective one. It has to be a multilateral one. If I invented a vaccine and decided to keep it just for Canadians, it's of no use. We, it has to be shared. Uh, so whoever bring, comes up with these vaccines is going to have to share them to, to inoculate themselves from future spread of, of a pandemic like, uh, like COVID-19. Same thing on the global recession. If our economy somehow miraculously recovers all by itself, that's temporary. It can't last if others are suffering. So to come out of this situation, it's going to require multilateral approach. And I think there's no better champion than Canada uh, and we're showing that with our leadership in the Ottawa group for the WTO, trying to be a voice of reason for a rules-based system, order in society, because currently where we live is in what I would describe as a strong man era. If you look around the world, you know, I won't name all the countries because I'll probably never be invited to some of the embassies, but the fact is we're living in an era where, you know, everybody's kind of like established their own territory and whatever they do in that territory is fair game, no one's going to call them on it. Right? That's not uh, a recipe for global order. Uh, that is a recipe for you know, uh, uh, anarchy and chaos in the world. So we've clearly got to restore uh, confidence and a belief that trade is good, that multilateralism is good. Is it perfect? No, there's gonna be always issues, we know that. But we've gotta bring that back because I don't see a way forward on these issues um, if we, if we uh, go down the path that, um, that, we're, that we're currently on. Well, at this stage, I really would like to bring in a question from the audience, because our, right now we saw a positive note about essentially global co collaboration and, and the place of Canada in it. But our most voted question from the audience probably mm, has a more pessimistic note. So Michael asked, how concerned should Canadian companies be about the American election in November? How can they manage risk associated with instability in the United States? Well, it's a great question, Michael. Thank you. And obviously you reflect the views of many on the, on the call. Uh, certainly something that we in the Business Council and like others are paying close attention to. You know, this might surprise you, but um, I'm not sure there's a right answer uh, for the outcome of that election for a variety of reasons. Um, suffice to say, we've experienced a lot of challenges with the current administration and I think our government um, has done uh, along with the support of, of, of a very multi-partisan or multi-party support and support from business and labor and others in taking that so-called Team Canada approach and sticking together uh, on the renegotiations for the USMCA and, and what's called CUSMA up here. Now comes the implementation and the execution. We've got to make sure we get that right. We've got to get away from a world where every day we're worried about tariffs being imposed in the name of national security on steel or on aluminum or things like that. So we've got work to do if the current administration were to be reelected and not like it's uh, you know, easy going uh, either. And I'm sure that's not a surprise to many on the call. Having said that, you know, um, the, the Biden administration, some would say, is um, as protectionist, if not more, uh, in, in some cases, uh, for, for the agenda that, that they are running on in their platform. Um, we need to be very mindful um, uh, of the fact that the North American economy is very integrated. And so if the American economy suffers as a result of policies that might create more deficit, more debt, uh, and so forth, um, that's going to have a ripple effect on Canada. So obviously we want whoever wins the U.S. election to successfully build back their economy because it's going to be of uh, a benefit to us. The other thing that we're watching with great interest, um, and not, I want to mention this for a variety of reasons, including I'm speaking at the UFC here, but... Um, uh, it's Keystone XL pipeline. You know, uh, that is a very major uh, project that one of your, our, our, our fellow alumni graduates, Russ Gerling, uh, over at, at uh, TC Energy, of course, um, has been spearheading that project. And we're watching with great interest that uh, Biden administration wouldn't kill a project that's creating uh, literally tens of thousands of jobs for Americans, never mind Canadians. Uh, it's creating security of supply. Uh, it's providing an opportunity for, um, you know, for Canadian exports. It's the largest export that we give uh, is, is oil. Um, we've got to make sure that that pipeline uh, continues to get built. Provincial government of Alberta uh, has, been a, has been an ally. Uh, we want to make sure that the federal government speaks out loudly and clearly um, uh, in support of the Keystone 
uh, pipeline as we go forward. It's critically important to Alberta, but frankly, it's critically important to the economic recovery of our country where oil and gas um, is a major contributor to our GDP. And so any point of view that somehow we can bring, build back our economy uh, without oil and gas is frankly absurd. Thank you for that, Goldie. Um, and speaking of strong leadership, my next question is, you know, I know you work closely with many leaders in Canada, um, Canada's largest companies, and you've already mentioned, you know, how good leadership will be critical in seeing these and really any sized company succeed. Um, what can Canadian business leaders do right now to make sure their companies find their place in this new reality? Another great question, uh, and I can tell you, having just had a board meeting with about 25 of them yesterday, uh, this is a real-time question for them as well. Uh, they are, you know, uh, they have the challenge of, of course, having their fiduciary duty and responsibility for their company, uh, making sure that it gets through this crisis. As I said, in some cases, it's going to be just fine. In other cases, there's growth happening. In other cases, they're very vulnerable. And I think that we have to be mindful that at a time like this, some companies are going to be takeover targets. There's going to be consolidation that's that's going to be happening here. And we want to do everything we can to preserve, you know, and, and celebrate and champion, um, you know, Canadian companies uh, around the world. So there's an aspect of this that's just very real, head down. How do we get through this? Um, what are the what are the things that we need to do for our employees in terms of their continuity and their safety and uh, support for their working from home if that's what they're doing? Um, you know, uh, there's obviously the, the the need to get customers back. Uh, you know, I think of some of the distressed industries. Um, you know, this is what life's going to be like, folks, for a couple of years. And you can't live in a cocoon. We can't live in fear. We're going to have to figure out how to responsibly navigate our way through life with COVID. It's coexisting with it. And we owe that to ourselves because your neighbors, my neighbors, their businesses are at stake here. And if we want to keep the pressure down on the spending and the deficit and so forth, we're going to have to make sure that we build back our economy. And I think many are trying to figure out how best to do that, obviously totally compliant with public health uh, safety guidelines. On, on, on another front, um, you know, many of these CEOs, and I, you know, I, I'm, I, I literally pinch myself every day. I'm so blessed to get to see see them and learn from them and hear from them. They love this country. They care deeply about Canada and they care deeply about our place in the world. They care deeply about our people because they're their employees, they're their neighbors, they're their shareholders. And there's a real concern about our competitiveness and they want to be seen as strong advocates for improving our position in the world. And that requires good public policy. It requires advocacy for sound fiscal policy, sound regulatory policy, you know, sound taxation policy, sound immigration policies. All of these things through which we and many other organizations have been championing are really important to our members. And the last but not least, and I can't, I can't stress this enough, there's, um, there's enormous pressures on so many leaders today to deal with so many things. Some things you're not even trained to do and you didn't even think it was gonna be a part of your job, but now every corporate leader has to have policies on, on environment, policies on Black Lives Matter, on BIPOC, on gender, on, and these are all critically important social and frankly economic issues for the country. So you can see how being in a C-suite it's just overwhelming. So much is coming at you and you're dealing with a pandemic. You've got safety issues that you've never had before, which is, you know, the number one issue for any CEO on any day is the safety and well-being of my employees and my, uh, my, uh, my, my customers. There's a lot going on right now. And I think that, that for many leaders, uh, it, they're, they're, they're learning a lot about themselves. Um, I run a podcast, if I can make a shameless uh, plug here for all of your, your listeners, called Speaking of Business. And in each one of those podcasts, I interview one of our members for the most part, CEOs, speaking of business.ca. And I, you know, I spend 30, 40 minutes with them and talking about their journey, who they are, what gets them out of bed every morning, what challenges them, what's keeping them up. Uh, I would really encourage you to, to listen to it because the knowledge that I gain from those is available to you for free. So please do tune in uh, and check that out. I will just say one last thing, and that is that, um, you know, we're quite concerned about the labor market. Uh, we're very concerned that the structural issues that are in Canada around the demographics, we're aging, uh, breaking news, we're not doing very well at it. We're, we're making about 1.4 babies per family. That's nowhere near the 2.1 that's necessary to replace yourself. Our immigration is gonna take a hit as long as COVID exists. We're not getting the levels of immigrants that we need, even though, again, to the government's credit, an ambitious uh, immigration agenda was announced for a three-year plan, which we totally endorse. 
um, we're going to need to reskill people more, right? Because there's going to be a, a, a number of jobs that aren't coming back. I don't want to, you know, to, to, to fear people, to scare people, but that's just the reality. We've got to be ready for that. How can we train people to be employed and be productive? Uh, those are big issues. Childcare. I mean, I've written a, an op-ed piece with my friend Hassan Youssef at the Canadian Labour Congress talking about how labour and business believe that childcare is an absolute imperative um, you know, to get more people in the labor force. It's not just for women, it's for single dads and others who are, or, or dads who are at home who also need it as well. But we, we have to make sure that we have more people in the workforce. And I'm particularly, and I'm biased of a father of three daughters here, but I'm very worried about the impact that this is having on women. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done in this area here, and I'm, I'm, and, and I'm quite um, concerned about that. And last but not least, the issue of mental health is very prevalent, and we hear it from our CEOs. Um, you know, making sure that people have access to these services to get them through this crisis. So as you can tell, I could go on, but this is all of the issues I hear from our members uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So they're dealing with a lot. Thank you. Uh, if possible, I would like now to, uh, to move towards some questions from the audience. And uh, when our participants registered for the event, they entered, some of them entered their questions for which we are very grateful. And we looked at common themes in those questions to you. And uh, the most prevalent theme was obviously related to oil and gas industry. So the question is very broad and it will take the whole day to discuss all the details, but probably two most pressing things that we are noticing here. First, how do you see the future of energy industry or particularly oil and gas in North, Amer North America? And second, young people who are right now starting their career in Alberta, should they seriously consider oil and gas or um, they should think about alternatives? Well, uh, again, very deep question and near and dear to my heart for all the reasons I've already stated. Um, you know, I want to recognize that we've been through so many crises in Alberta. And if there's one thing I know about the people of Alberta, it is um, a, a spirit, a spirit, a can do spirit. Like we get stuff done and we overcome, uh, you know, the adversity and the obstacles. But this is a particularly uh, challenging time. Let's not kid ourselves. There's been a perfect storm. Premier Kenny talks about all of the elements that came at the same time. You know, when your barrel is worth more than its contents, that can't, you know, illustrate the, the problem. Luckily, that's not the case anymore. But when it was, it kind of underscored the challenge that the, uh, that the industry faces. You know, I think that, again, I, I use the phrase adult conversation because I do feel like um, with all due respect to our political, uh, uh, you know, political parties and stuff, going all the way back to Kyoto till now, you know, these governments, they go to all these international conferences, they make all these, you know, commitments and promises. Not one had a plan. There's not a plan today, <laughs> you know, and, and then they come back and then they blame business. Oh, it's all your fault. You don't have a plan. You're not doing what you need to do. And all we've been begging and screaming for is uh, an adult conversation. Let's sit down and have a real conversation where the facts are simply what they are. They're the facts. We cannot deny that we have a resource that is in demand around the world. You know, people say 30, 40, 50 years. These are OECD. This is not, it's OECD saying this and others. The demand is like this. There's no denying that even with the COVID situation and everything, I know a lot of people are talking about, oh, you know, I'm not going to do this. Frankly, car sales are up. People don't want to sit in public transport or an Uber and they're buying their own cars. So the demand is not going to change anytime soon. We're too big of a country to believe that the infrastructure would be in place overnight on some of these uh, you know, technological advancements, whether it's EVs or other things. Um, having said that, I am keen uh, in, in seeing the diversification that Alberta has talked about forever. You know, and one thing I can say as an Albertan is that I've witnessed all the attempts to diversify that quickly got set aside the minute the barrel price went back up. We went back to regularly scheduled programming and it was all in on oil and gas. So clearly diversification is necessary, which is not to be interpreted as you throw away what is. You have to leverage what is. You have to use it as an asset to be able to pivot to the, the new world um, that is eventually coming, but is not imminent. You know, hydrogen was announced recently uh, this week. That's a decade away probably, you know? I mean, 2030 plans are gonna be very different than what the 2050 plans are. And here again, we in the business community have gone to the government and said, look, um, you, 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 can't just, you can't just say things and not have a clue how we're gonna do it. So why don't we work together? Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate in that I represent really a cross section of all the sectors 
uh, in the Canadian economy. So my team here is working on all the issues you can imagine, whether it's in agriculture or in oil and gas or in mining or in airlines and transportation, and we're going to pull together what can the 2030 plan look like? Because if you don't have a plan, you don't know how to measure it, you're not going to get anywhere. So we're going to take the initiative on our own. We've offered an opportunity to work with government and we're encouraged that uh, Minister Wilkins and others are willing to sit down and talk with us uh, in a serious way about what can we do without creating further harm to our economy, uh, doing it responsibly and recognizing that the, the key, and I want to just call out the comment in the throne speech that said, um, I'm paraphrasing here, but that, that the energy sector uh, is critical to the innovation necessary to address climate change. I, I, I'm not quoting exactly, but I'm pretty sure that's what that line says. And I gotta tell you, I almost fell out of my chair when I saw it because I wasn't expecting it given all the emphasis this government has put on climate. Frankly, to some extent, COVID has been a disruption for them for their own agenda, right? And so now they're being forced to deal with COVID and the economy and all of that. And so we're saying, um, if, if, if we are truly gonna build back better, as the, as the saying goes, it, it has to include natural resources. And it has to recognize that the, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to create conditions that suffocate the capital that goes into these large Canadian companies in the natural resources space. At a, at a, I'm using that in its most um, uh, macro uh, definition. Because if you do that, you are actually suffocating the capital necessary to do innovation, to bring solutions to climate change. These are not found with the greatest of respect in a basement somewhere. These take billions of dollars of investments and commitment and write-offs and write-downs to get to the level where you actually have a viable renewable plan and a viable product that you can come as a commodity that you can sell uh, and, 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 and move around the world. That's one component. Second component is regulations are really important. You know, you can't have uh, a message around the world that we're some kind of a banana republic that approves projects, but the next government can, can pull that and you can change the rules midstream. That is not how Canada is supposed to work. And so on those things, obviously I don't miss my words about it because we're very forceful on these issues because our concern is if you suffocate the capital, boy, there's no such thing as an economic recovery. Wow, thank you for that. Um, so number one question coming up right now uh, through the, the Q&A from Lonnie um, says, do you foresee a long-term effect on commercial real estate with businesses managing to operate with staff at home offices? Um, are, they looking, are they likely to look hard at their brick and mortar costs and reevaluate the space yeah. needs? Great question. It's something, again, we've been dealing with quite regularly. Um, and I think the answer here is where I started off. It's, it's, it's uneven. Uh, I'm told uh, by some of our commercial real estate members that uh, the downtowns are where they're facing some of the challenges in the short term, largely driven by the fact that people don't want to use public transit to come downtown, number one. Number two, downtown is high rises, and so you're now you're talking about having elevators and management of elevators going up and down. I still think we can figure it out. I mean, Beijing has figured it out. Tokyo's figured it out. Hanoi has figured it out. We better figure out how to get people back to our downtowns. But in the short term, I'm told that the periphery, the suburbs and all of those, the malls are busy, commercial real estate's quite active. Um, there is um, in the housing side, I know it's not the direct question, but on the housing side, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity driven by low, uh, low interest rates. I think that what you're gonna see is, and, 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 and I, I can't remember if Jim mentioned this, but like my master's thesis at the University of Calgary was on policy making in times of crises. And part of what it, what it implied, uh, the concluded with was, a lot of things people say in the crises without thinking through whether they really mean it and whether they're going to really stick to it in the long run. And eventually we go back to normal. And I'm not saying that everything's going to be the same, but I think a lot more will be the same three, four, five years out from, from now than, than we, we believe to be the case today. So while Shopify down the street here has decided to send everybody home, my guess is they'll probably have a premises again one day because people are going to say, I really like going to meetings. I like to see my colleagues. I like to go up to an easel and say, that didn't work. What about this idea? Eventually those things will come back, but there will be some short-term pain uh, in, and I think the downtowns, uh, partly driven by, you know, as I said, the economic carnage that I see as a result of the public transportation challenges that we face. I hope that wasn't a stock tip for somebody. <laughs> well, going from real estate to the next uh, industry, our top question right now from Kamal is about renewables. So do you believe that the pandemic will provide new opportunities for Canadian businesses to export renewables? 
law and policy is strengthening sustainable energy, but do you feel that the pandemic will encourage more support for renewables? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, and again, the, one of the great demands uh, out there remains for uh, LNG, for example, you know, uh, and then of course the other renewables as well. But I mean, in terms of uh, less greenhouse gas emitting, you know, LNG has got a tremendous demand around the world. We have a lot of places where we should be able to build more ports uh, to be able to export uh, export that product. Um, look, many companies are on the journey of becoming renewables companies, but it's 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 a small percentage of their revenues today. It'll take time to build up that revenue base and to show the viability uh, of some of these. I refer to the most recent announcement made by the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, where they're starting to do what I would describe as pilot projects, testing you know whether there is an appetite from capital markets and, cap and investors to come into smaller scale projects to see whether we can you know retrofit buildings, whether we can get our buses you know, uh, converted. And so the, I think that this is a, a, a journey that, that we are on. Um, I wouldn't sell all your oil and gas stock and I wouldn't buy all your renewable stock either. Like, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a balance. And all I'm worried about is, is if the capital is suffocated to these large businesses, I'm not sure the innovation we need is actually gonna, is gonna take place. So, you know, allow, make the case and, and speak up for those of you who believe in what I'm saying. I think it's really important that the, the sensible, I think the sensible perspective on this is not drowned out by those who just think we've got to turn everything off and uh, somehow live in the, you know, <laughs> live, in the, live in the dark. So another top question coming through here continues the theme of investment. So what do you see as some of the structural impe impediments to attracting foreign direct investment in Canadian companies and what regulatory change might be required to overcome them? Well, um, a couple of things there, uh, you know, uh, Ian, uh, Ian McKay over at Invest Canada, I think him and his team have been doing a very good job in trying to create a narrative for the country because our current brand is nice. Well, that's great if you're a cookie, but not so great if you're a country competing for capital, right? And you've got to build on that. And I think that the work that, they're, that they've embarked on is a great example of trying to figure out what's, their, what's our USP? What's our message to uh, investors? And I think that you know the natural resources message and the human resources message is a given. That's very important. But you know markets are very astute. Investors are very astute. They drill down and they do their homework. And and part of the things that they hear is, um, you know, there's an area that we're doing very well in FDI. FDI is up in a number of cases, to be fair, and particularly in the innovation space. You know, there's a lot of investment going into artificial intelligence and so forth. There's a lot of startups, and uh, you know, there's a number of Canadians who are living in the Silicon Valley who come back home and making their businesses work here. I think of someone like uh, Michael Ketchum at Wealth Simple, who you know, from was Canadian, went to Cal you know California, came back. One of our members. There's a lot of those kinds of things that are happening, and I think that investment is important, and it comes because in part of the human resources that I mentioned. But the natural resources side of this thing is just too important to our economy and their FDI is down. And the reason FDI is down there is, is it's bills, it's like bills like C69. Uh, it's, it's like, um, you know, the, the decisions that I mentioned earlier where a project like Northern Gateway was approved by a previous uh, administration after having gone through an exhaustive natural, uh, National Energy Board exercise, you know, or you take what, um, what uh, TransCanada's, uh, then can TransCanada Energy East project uh, had to go through. It spent, you know, shy of a billion dollars in a regulatory process, only to be told by a new government that we're going to actually make you do it all over again. Well, that's absurd. Uh, you take a look at tech resources who had to have, a, you know, a renewal of a mine that's already been existing for three decades, took eight years to go through that project from a provincial level, and now got told you also have to do a federal level. These are not the way, and these are not the things that will allow you to attract foreign investment. It doesn't matter. People say, oh, Goldie, why, should, why do you say it? Well, it doesn't matter whether I say it or don't say it. People can do their homework. <laughs> There's this thing called the internet. They can read what's being reported in Canada of some of the structural impediments that are self-made. These aren't imposed on us with fairness to Donald Trump or anybody else. We did it to ourselves and we can stop it. And we need to stop it so that that investment, which creates jobs, which allows us to invest in our social programs, which builds infrastructure, which takes care of people who can't take care of themselves, if we don't do that, you cannot spend your way out of this mess, right? We cannot have, sorry, I keep looking at the peace tower here out of my office, but we cannot just keep adding to the deficit and the debt as if it's nothing because, you know, I'm taking on the debt so Canadians don't have to and interest rates are low. That is not a plan. And that's what we're really gonna be looking at when the economic statement comes. 
that says, how are you going to do these things that I've discussed on immigration, on trade and investment, because all of those are critical uh, to an economic recovery. And by the way, those are the things that, as I said, are key to the social issues that, that so, much, so many of us are worried about, like mental health in particular, I think is something that, because it's unknown and unseen so often, I'm very concerned of the consequences of that for the next three, six, nine, 12 months here. All right, Goldie, thank you very much for this conversation. And we still have actually lots of questions from uh, people who registered in advance and from our live audience, but we also have to be mindful of the time. So send, send it to me online, I'll, I'll respond, trust me, send it out. We'll be happy to engage with Canadians who care about our country as much as they seem to. We, we can actually have the follow-up discussion or maybe if we have another meeting, because as I expected, this meeting went, uh, we, we were able, all our audience was uh, interested. We, we didn't lose any participants. And uh, basically, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, at this stage, I would like to uh, inform our audience. So this was inaugural event of Global Business Futures Initiative. G Global Business Futures Initiative, we are building a safe place to learn about what business, business leaders need to do to compete in the whole new world. And we will have a series of monthly conversations uh, with business leaders of, in Canada and worldwide uh, on the issues that we have discussed before. And I'm really looking forward to invite Goldie again uh, for a set of additional questions. Jim, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Alex, and uh, thanks, Tanya. And wow, Goldie, that was really amazing. Appreciate it so much. You use some pretty scary language like adult conversation and, uh, you know, uh, nobody's got our back and uh, we, we have to, uh, uh, we've had it too easy. And so this is a lot for us to think about and I really appreciate you bringing these things up. I'm so glad that you uh, uh, are interested and obviously passionately interested in what's going on in, in Alberta and in Calgary and uh, you know, that's great because as you recall, we have great skiing and great golf courses and uh, we welcome you here anytime at all. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you uh, to our moderators. Thank you to the audience. And uh, this is the first of many, many events. And hopefully as we go down the road, we'll always remember a great kickoff of having Goldie Hyder to the Global Business Futures Initiative. Thank you so much. All the best to everyone.